Good morning. Good to see all of you, uh, especially an hour earlier. Uh, but good to see all of you. I uh, saw a lot of you out at Indian Creek Friday. Had a good time out there. Uh, go ahead and get started with our announcements. I'm going to do one that I forgot to put a slide for. I'm going to go ahead and do it so I don't forget about it. So Miss Jean doesn't have to wave me down. It's in the bulletin, but just in case you don't read the bulletin, surely everyone reads the bulletin, but just in case. This Thursday, they're going to have another, this time it's not going to be a sewing day, it's going to be like a decorating day. So they've made all those stuffed animals, um, bears and dogs, puppy dogs, for the foster kids at the Royal Family Kids Camp, but they need to decorate them now. And so maybe you're not good at sewing, but maybe you're a good artist. You're good at drawing. So if you're good at drawing and want to help out, they're going to be, what, 9 o'clock? 9 o'clock over in the Fellowship Hall this Thursday, April 4th, um, to decorate all those stuffed animals that they've created that they've sewed together for the foster kids at the Royal Family Kids Camp. So if you can help out with that, join them this Thursday, April 4th, uh, in the Fellowship Hall at 9 a.m. Uh, another reminder, as always, read your Bible. There's Bible reading plans we have on version. There's passages on the back of the prayer request list. It's, it's on the pew. I keep pointing up. You're wondering where I'm pointing at. Uh, they're on the pew. Uh, in the On the back side of the prayer request list, there's passages you can read each day. Uh, but find some way to be in the Word each and every day. It's so important. Uh, next. School prayer. Uh, every week we've been praying for a different fruit of the Spirit. If you recall, we began the school year praying for each different group. So we prayed for teachers. We prayed for custodians, bus drivers, coaches, paras. Uh, we prayed for every grade level, pre-K, kindergarten, all the way through seniors. And now we've transitioned into praying each week for a different fruit of the spirit to be present in the life of our school. So we're praying pray, praying for goodness this week. Um, we've done love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Now we're doing goodness. So this week, and there'll be a prayer posted on Tuesday. That's the day that we typically uh, have signed up to be especially mindful of our school and pray for our school. Uh, but this week, if you're praying for our school, pray that our school be full of goodness Students, staff, adults, everybody, that they'll have goodness in their lives. And that goodness will be evident that that goodness will be a fruit of the Spirit. Uh, next, feasting on the Word. Uh, that slide doesn't look quite as good as I was hoping it would. But uh, we were off this past week because of Good Friday at Indian Creek. Now we're going to be back. Uh, 6.30, we're going to eat. 7 o'clock, we're going to be looking at the resurrection. Uh, Mark 16, uh, the story of Jesus' victory over death. So join us for that. Like I said, we eat at 6.30. Now our time of worship, prayer, study will be at 7 o'clock over in the fellowship hall. Next, fostering community. If you have items that you need to bring, today is the day we need them by so they can deliver them for April up to Alexandria, to the people at the uh, fostering community. Uh, we're, we're collecting certain items to give to uh, teenagers, kids that are kind of in the verge of uh, aging out of the foster care system but might not have like a support network to fall back on. Uh, I've said this before, many of you, uh, when you were young adults, you probably entered into the world, but if you had family, you always knew that you had kind of like a safety net as you tried to navigate being an adult. A lot of these kids, they're in the foster system and they age out and they don't have that same foster, uh, that same safety net. Uh, they don't necessarily have people they can pick up and call like many of us did. And so we try to help them out by providing some personal care items to kind of ease their burden. Uh, we have a list that back there that we've uh, narrowed it down to. Uh, and so if you brought some of those items for April, make sure you get them here. Or if you have already brought them, hopefully you place them in the, the room back there so Ms. Claudia and Ms. Jean can gather them together and deliver them to Alexandria. Anything we don't have at the end of today, uh, we do have some funds available we'll purchase and add to, to, to make up the difference. But if you got stuff, go ahead and bring it and, or unload your car, whatever, drop it off back there so they can take that stuff up. And then, of course, once they clear it out, we'll start again through April collecting the stuff. So we'll put a different sign-up sheet up for next month and you can sign up. If you sign up for an item, note how many you're gonna bring. Like you might wanna bring 10 of one thing, 10 of the other. You might wanna bring 20 of all of it. You might wanna bring five of one. Note how many you're bringing because we need 20 of each item, all right? So make sure you get your stuff back there today. Uh, and if not, uh, make arrangements for Gene and Claudia to get it to them. Next, all right, uh, Cole and Morgan's wedding this Saturday. You're all invited at um, the museum down in Longleaf at 5 o'clock, the Southern Forest Heritage Museum, uh, with a reception to follow. So all of you are invited to that, the, the actual invitations on the board back there, if you want to look at it. Uh, next, photo director. We're not taking pictures today because uh, it's Easter, um, and actually Nathan should even be here, but he just came straight from getting off work. So, uh, But next Sunday, uh, he'll be taking more pictures. So uh, if you're, let me know in advance. Uh, if you're planning on coming so we can make sure that uh, we got slots available. But uh, try. I know some of you have taken a picture, but there's more that haven't taken a picture. 
Um, like I said, don't make me search the internet because uh, I might not be in a mood to get the best picture. So uh, make sure you get one taken where you can at least say, can we try again? And it's not something that I pull off the internet, but we do need new pictures. Because if you look at our old directory, like some of these kids, like we're about to have their senior night <laughs> and they're like five. So there's been a lot of changes since the last directory. So we do need an updated one. A lot of people have joined us since then. So if you can take your picture next week, text me, let me know. I'll let Nathan know. He'll be here with the camera. Which It's real simple. You just go to the library. He snaps a photo. You fill out the form with your information. You're done. So, but we do need to make that happen ASAP. Next. Oh, Good Friday in Indian Creek. It's passed, but I want to thank all of you who came out. A special one to thank everyone who helped out, everyone who stuffed eggs and then showed up to hide eggs, everyone who provided food and prepared food, everyone who collected stuff from the church and brought it out there. Uh, a lot of people did a lot of work to make this uh, happen, but I think it's something that we all enjoy. So I'm grateful to everyone that came out and participated, grateful to everyone that helped make it happen, who provided things, who helped set up, who helped take down. Uh, grateful to all of you. Uh, I think some good memories were made, so we're grateful for that. Uh, next, water challenge. A reminder, I forgot to put it in the bulletin, but the offering for the water challenge money will be at the end of worship. Okay, so as always, your normal check, money, cash, whatever. If you want to do your normal contribution to church, put that in the plate when we pass the plate immediately after the Lord's Supper. Okay. If you want to give to the water challenge, we will pass the plates again after the sermon. That's when you put in your water challenge checks, money, whatever. All right, it's easy. It's just to keep it. It's two separate collections. So uh, we've obviously spent the last two weeks trying, if you're like me, to varying levels of success to do kind of like a fast from, from everything but water, liquid-wise. Uh, and we've been trying to save all that money and all the money that we save by not going to the coffee shop or getting a big Coke or going to Sonic, all that type of stuff. All the money we save... Uh, we're going to give in this water challenge collection and we'll give it to Healing Hands International. It's a Christian group out of Nashville. They're involved in a lot of ministries, international outreach. And one of the things they do is drill wells in places. You can go to hhi.org uh, and that's the Healing Hands International website. You can click on clean water is one of their missions and you can see a map. Uh, it's got a map of the world and in blue are all the countries where they drilled wells. Uh, it's a lot of countries all over the world. And so we give this money to help provide uh, drinking water to people. Uh, we don't have access to it. That's still, last I looked, it's still the leading cause of death. It's 2024, and the leading cause of death in the world is people don't have access to clean drinking water. It's amazing because, you know, we forget how blessed we are. We just go to a faucet, turn it, and we're good. But there's a lot of people in the world that don't have that. And so hopefully this will go to be a blessing to those that are in need. I think that's all the announcements it is. If you will stand, uh, we're going to begin our worship this morning uh, by reading from Psalm 118, uh, verses 14 through 24. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord performs valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord performs valiantly. I will not die, but live and tell of the works of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not turned me over to death. Open the gates of righteousness to me. I will enter through them. I will give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. I will give thanks to you for you have answered me and you have become my salvation. A stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This comes about from the Lord. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Let's worship God together this morning. <clears throat> Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he rose, with a mighty triumph for his soul. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ the Lord. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Jesus, my Lord, a 
Glory will shine. 
sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. <laughs> One day he's coming a glorious day. In just a little while, uh, our sermon is going to be from 1 Corinthians 15. And one of the things Paul says there is that Christ died in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and then on the third day he rose in accordance with the scriptures. And every time we sang that chorus we were singing the exact thing that Paul was talking about there in 1 Corinthians 15. But before you get to 1 Corinthians 15, you have to get to 1 Corinthians 11. And it's interesting that Paul talks about handing on this tradition, the gospel, in 1 Corinthians 15, but he uses the same language in 1 Corinthians 11 when talking about the sacrifice of Christ and how we remember that sacrifice. Verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're proclaiming a truth that we believe that Christ died on the cross for our sins and that he rose from the dead. That he conquered victory. And notice he says, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The last part of that course we sang five times. One day he's coming. A glorious day. And so we celebrate our Lord's victory over death today. But there is no resurrection without the cross. There are two sides of the same coin. And let's remember that as we partake of this bread. And I'm going to ask Halen, if he will, to offer thanks. <coughs> Before we reflect this opportunity that you uh, for to be able to gather today and to worship you and to learn more about you, and thank you most of all for your son to come to the heart to live and be crucified on the cross so we can be forgiven of our sins and the praise to take this bread and the the body of our Savior. And the blue in a pleasing manner. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a thing
Gus, if you would offer a prayer for the cup. Father, thank you for scanning the house this morning. As you be with us now, as we take up this cup, represents the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary, and it's the same blood that washes away all the sins that were committed against thee. Thank you for sending your son Jesus. I'm thankful for the resurrection that he arose, because he lives that we can all have eternal life with him. Just in prayer. Amen. study religions around the world, uh, the idea of an offering, a sacrifice, whether it be of money or gold or uh, an animal sacrifice to propitiate the gods, that's not something unique to Christianity. But what's interesting is if you look at most, if not all the other religions, it's always done in order to get God, God, whoever they believe in, to do something for them. For us, our offering is done in response to what God has already done. We don't make an offering because we hope God will love us or that God will accept us if we just give enough. God has already given far more than we could ever give in return. And so our offering is done in response to what God has done, not as an attempt to get God to do something for us. He's already done the most beautiful thing he could for us. He gave his son. First John says we love because he first loved us. Let's keep that in mind as we make our offerings this morning. Uh, Daniel, will you 
Say the prayer. I do much gratitude, Heavenly Father. Thank you for staying when you come and listen to your word, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your son who paid the ultimate sacrifice to die on the cross for the white point of our sins. Uh, be with us as we uh, give back a portion of that which he has most graciously uh, given to us. In your gracious holy name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Before we get into the prayer request, let's go ahead and dismiss our kids, six, seven, and under. See, we got quite a few names on our list. I'm going to encourage you to read over the names, uh, but I'm going to just go over the most recent ones. Uh, uh, read over them and uh, include them in your prayer life. Uh, and if you see something that needs to be changed, let us know so we can uh, keep our list current. Uh, as far as the most recent requests, we have Avery Fuller, Roger Welch, Woodrow Thompson, Bridget, Bridget Odom, uh, Glenn King. Cheyenne uh, Bordelon, uh, Claudia Troll Johnson, Matthew Odom, Penny Reeves, Lucky Shockley, Rick McGuffey, Bill Garner, uh, Macy Bordelon, uh, Luther Powell, Hunter Anderson, Clifton Peters, Madison Shadrick, uh, Lucy Ham, uh, Michelle Doza. We need to be in prayer for them. Quite a few others on there also, so read over them uh, when you get a chance. Uh, we need to be in prayer for those on the continued list and those on the cancer list. And also remember those caregivers that work with these people too. So uh, pray for them and uh, so they can make the right decisions that affect these individuals. We need to be in prayer for those uh, military and their families and those that are in bereavement of the loss of loved ones. You got anyone else you'd like to add or anything you'd like to make note? Matt Jr. and Sarah will be traveling later today. Okay. She lays in the hospital this Okay. Okay. Here you can check me out. Okay. Anything else? If uh, if you think of anything later on that you want to make known or anyone you want to add just give them justin if you won't have to come in the book for you uh that's it let's stand and uh ben will be leading us in prayer <coughs> our most kind of giving heavenly father really it is a blessing to be able to gather here this morning 
We thank you for your kindness and your mercy, Father, even when we don't deserve it. Father, thank you for the freedom that we have to come and gather here this morning to sing songs of praise and to give you the glory in all that we do, Father. Um, we do pray for the safety of those who don't have that opportunity, Father, who have to worship behind closed doors, have to worship in private. Father, um, just continue to bless them, um, help them not to lose their faith. Father, we, we lift up these names that um, was mentioned here this morning, Father. Brother QA, um, Father, um, give him the strength to overcome, just be with him and comfort him. Um, Father, all the names that are on our Recent and continuing prayer requests, um, Father, comfort them as only you can. Father, we pray for those who are facing upcoming surgeries. Um, just be with the doctors. Um, give them the, the knowledge and the capability to uh, perform the duties that they need to do. Um, be with those that are undergoing surgeries, Father, that they'll have the strength to overcome. Father, we pray for this country. We pray for those that are in positions of leadership. That we know that you allow them to be there. Uh, Father, we pray that you will um, let them look to you for guidance in the decisions that they need to be made. Uh, Father, be with Justin this morning. Uh, give him a ready recollection of things that he needs to say. Uh, and us as listeners, Father, that will always read your word and um, apply your word to our lives and always help us to follow and be better Christians. Um, just forgive us for our sins. This is our praise in Jesus, our Savior. Amen. <laughs> Passages mostly in the epistles that deal with the cross and various aspects of the cross. But today we conclude with the cross of Christ as God's plan. So I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I make known to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you also stand, by which you also are, if you hold firmly to the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I handed down to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. The cross of Christ was God's plan. Oftentimes we spend a significant part of our life wondering what's God's plan. A lot of times we're focused on us as individuals, but we also think more on a grand scale. What is God's plan? In fact, such musings have even made it into pop culture. You're about to hear 100% of what I know about rap. Drake had a rap called God's Plan. I'm not recommending Drake, nor this song, nor any rap song to you. But I looked at the lyrics, and I don't really know why he called it God's Plan. Uh, God's Plan, God's Plan, I hold back sometimes. Yeah, I won't. Yeah, I feel good. Sometimes I don't. Hey, don't. don't. I finesse down Western Street. Hey, Ness. Um, I go hard on Southside G. Uh, I, mean, I was like, what does this have to do with God's plan? Like, that's, and, but that, if you search God's plan on the internet, you know what you're going to find? Probably that song. Here's the thing. I looked at that song and was like, why in the world did you just throw a, a, 
a dart at a board with a bunch of random words, and that's how you decided that's what you're going to name your rap song? The people in Paul's day, to them the cross was about as connected to God's plan as the lyrics I just read you are connected to God's plan. They, they made about as much sense of a cross, an instrument of torture being part of God's plan, as we look at those rap lyrics and say, why in the world did you name this song God's plan? I mean, at the very beginning of the epistle I just read from, 1 Corinthians, what does Paul say? <laughs> if the cross is a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Jews couldn't believe that their Messiah would be nailed to a tree, because cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And the Greeks, their philosophical way of thinking said, nah, I can't be right. So most people in Paul's day couldn't get their mind wrapped around the idea that the cross was God's plan. You know, there's different types of plans. Sometimes plans are reactionary. We just saw a bridge collapse in Baltimore. And a lot of things were done in reaction to that. Obviously, if we had known it was going to happen, no one would have been on the bridge. But I'm told as soon as a mayday went out from the ship, the state police or somebody had the good sense to stop the bridge, to, to close the bridge to traffic and allow anyone that was on the bridge to try to get there off of it. But they limited the number of cars by closing the bridge before it got hit. But everything they did was in reaction to it. They start putting divers in the water looking for these people. Everything in reaction to this thing that they didn't know was going to happen. Uh-oh, we got to do something. When I say that the cross was God's plan, it was not, well, I didn't see that coming. They took the fruit and they ate it. Can you believe that? No, what are we going to do? I don't know. Here we go. Oh, I know. It wasn't a reactionary plan. It was a proactive plan. We read in the Bible that before the foundations of the world, God had a plan on how he was going to deal with us. He knew us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And so God's plan is proactive. It's according to the scriptures. In other words, we read about God's plan before the plan is carried out. And Paul lays out a few ways. He says, um, well, before we even get to what Paul says, Jesus himself said this, right? In Luke 24, now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all the things that are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, so it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. So he walked through them what this meant. First, Paul says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Some scriptures he might have had in mind. One of them we read Friday night at Indian Creek. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And then you read further into verses 11 and 12. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. For he will bear their wrongdoings. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the plunder with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was counted with wrongdoers. Yet he himself bore the sin of many, and interceded for the wrongdoers. When he writes to a different group to the Galatians, Paul says it in chapter 1, verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. That's a synonym for according to the scriptures. According to the, so God's will was that we might be rescued from the evil one, from this evil age, through Christ's sacrifice. It's a different way of saying that it, that it happened according to the scriptures. Paul says that he was buried. We're not sure exactly which passage this might be a reference to, but it's interesting that in Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, he will revive us after two days and will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Revive us from what? Death. And if you're dead, you've been buried. Now, interestingly, Hosea is probably prophesying about the nation as a whole, but one of the things you see in the New Testament is the nation of Israel as a whole it re receives redemption through Christ. Christ comes as, as Israel and then humanity's representative and does what Israel could not do for itself. 
That's one of the major themes of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, here's Jesus going out there, and he's tempted in all these ways that the Israelites were tempted by, and yet he overcomes it. And he even quotes from Deuteronomy the narrative of their tempting and their wandering in the wilderness when he's pushing back Satan's temptations. And so Hosea says, on the third day, he'll raise us up. Well, I don't know if Hosea fully understood what he was talking about, but I think God gave him those words so that we could look back on it and see that God was leaving little breadcrumbs throughout the Old Testament. Finally, Paul says Christ rose on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now, Jesus himself, again, in John chapter 2, when they start questioning him about coming in and cleansing the temple, Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews said to him, it took 46 years to build this temple, and yet you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. The scripture, not just the word that Jesus spoke, but the scripture. Now, if you go to Psalm 16, Verse 10, it says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the way of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I want to say that's a Psalm of David. I forgot to look, but I think it's a Psalm of David, which means it was written about a thousand years before Jesus. Isaiah prophesied about 700 years before Jesus. Hosea, I'd have to look it up, but probably roughly the same time before Jesus is Isaiah. We're not talking about the weatherman looking at the sky and saying it's going to rain next week. We're talking about hundreds of years, even a millennia, that the scriptures are recording certain things about who Jesus is. That's why Paul says that all these things happen according to the scriptures according to God's plan, because the cross was not a knee-jerk, stop-gap reaction to our sins. It was the eternal plan of God. And Paul wants them to understand that. Here's the thing. The cross of Christ was God's plan. He worked and achieved grace through Christ for us. And that's why God's plan makes use of those who've fallen short. In studying this passage this week, something that was brought to my attention, reading one of the commentaries that I hadn't really noticed before, he goes through, Paul does, and lists all these people who Christ appeared to, resurrected. At one time he says 500 of them. Some of whom are still alive. And then he says um, the apostles, the, all the, the rest of the apostles. In other words, a group. But there's three people in particular that he singles out. Interesting. Cephas, Peter, James, and himself. Isn't that interesting? Why does he single these people out? I wonder if it might be because all three of them failed Jesus in significant ways. First of all, you've got Peter. You probably know this story, but in Mark 14, Peter denies Jesus three times. After Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times, Jesus told him how he was about to mess up, and he still did. And then John 21, when Jesus has been resurrected, Peter sees Jesus on the shore. They're in the boat fishing. Peter jumps out the boat, swims to the shore. Then three times, Jesus asked Peter, what? Do you love me, Peter? Jesus is giving Peter an opportunity to roll back, to undo the three denials. If Peter denied Jesus three times, then Peter now has an opportunity to confess his love for Jesus three times. But the point I'm making here is, it's interesting that a resurrected Jesus, one of the people that are singled out that he appears to, is a fellow that in the garden, while Jesus is chained on trial, this guy's like, I don't know him. Uh Uh-uh, I'm not with him. I mean, when Jesus was at his lowest, when Jesus was most in need of a friend, Peter couldn't get far enough away, far enough away from Jesus, figuratively speaking. I swear to you, I don't know the guy. Who else did he does it say that he specifically appeared to? See, uh, not see this uh, James. Now, more than likely, most people agree we're talking about James, Jesus's brother. If you read the account of Jesus's ministry. If I'm not mistaken, the only time that James shows up, really, is when Mary and Jesus' siblings come to tell Jesus, hey, dial it back a little. People think you're crazy. In other words, James was not an original apostle. James was not, from what we can tell, a disciple of Jesus. His own brother, half-brother, of course, 
Uh, but still, his own flesh and blood, his sibling. And he didn't, at least, he, maybe he believed, but he didn't believe enough to leave everything behind. And yet, Paul says specifically that Jesus appeared to him. Paul refers to, to James in Galatians. He says, then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see another one of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Notice that he says, I did not see another one of the apostles except James. Paul refers to James as an apostle, even though he wasn't in the original 12. What makes James an apostle? Jesus appeared to him. Jesus appeared to him. Maybe in a way, somewhat, not exactly, but somewhat similar to how he appeared to Paul. We know later on in Galatians, Paul refers to James as one of the pillars of the church in Jerusalem, in addition to Peter and John. And so James, the Lord's brother, who didn't believe enough in Jesus to go full in and leave everything behind like the other 12 have, is one of the people that Jesus appears to. And finally, Paul says, Jesus to me. He refers to himself as one untimely born. Ectroma. It means an abortion, a stillbirth, or miscarriage. You see, the way Paul views it, he says, I had my opportunity. Or should have. The door could have been closed on me. But all these other people were coming to belief and faith. What was I doing? It wasn't just that I didn't believe. I was actively fighting against those who believed. And so, from his perspective, his faith was still born. It miscarried. He didn't have the faith that the original apostles did, at least not yet. But that faith that had been stillborn, God brought to life in him. I don't think it's a coincidence that Paul's dropping this in the resurrection section. <laughs> like there, there was a deadness in Paul, and yet he's brought alive. He looked like he, he was dead on arrival. And yet he was brought to life as one untimely boy. He writes to Timothy, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was previously a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost. And so God had this plan that through the cross of Christ and the resurrection, he would redeem us. And because we have grace through that cross, God's plan can incorporate people who have fallen short. People like Peter, or Cephas as Paul calls him, who denies Jesus three times. People like James, who grew up with Jesus. If anyone should have had an insight into who Jesus was, it should have been James, but not enough of an insight to leave everything behind and follow him until he experienced the resurrected Lord. And then last but not least, Paul, who describes himself as the chiefest of all sinners. He wasn't out there just getting into trouble on his own. He was making trouble, making trouble for the Lord's people. But notice what he says there. The grace of our Lord was more than abundant. He says in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 15, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's the story of the cross and the resurrection. By the grace of God, I am what I am. What I am. Paul was an apostle only because of God's grace. And here's the thing to Paul's credit, he didn't waste God's grace. He went to work. Paul's response to his salvation was hard work. You see, he knew hard work wasn't going to save him, it was a response to his salvation. Hard work was a response to what God had done, the grace of him. Gordon Fee says, even though his labor is a response to grace, it is more properly seen as the effect of grace. His hard work is the effect of grace. Because God had shown him grace, he said, I'm going to dig in and work hard for God. Because I know what I've been forgiven. 
I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was a violent man. But God forgave all that through the grace that comes from Christ's cross and through the power of his resurrection. Here's the thing. God's plan is grace to us and through us. How does that happen? It happens through Christ's cross and the resurrection of Jesus. And it incorporates people like all of us that have fallen short, that have failed God. But the reason he can incorporate it, us into his plan is because his plan is grace to us and through us. Paul says God's grace was for me. But God also meant for that grace to go through me. So I'll leave you with two questions this morning. In light of the empty tomb, has that grace come to you? I promise it's come to you. The question is, have you accepted it? Scripture says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you haven't received Christ, it ain't because Christ had not come to you wanting to be received. So first of all, you've got to ask the question, has that grace come to you? Have you received it? Have you welcomed it into your life? Are you still out there trying to, one, possibly prove yourself to God, or two, out there doing whatever you want to do without a thought to who God is in mind? The first question you've got to wrestle with is, has God's grace come to me? Have I accepted it? Have I welcomed it in? But two, and this is where I think most of us have to wrestle, <clears throat> has God's grace gone through me to other people? Do I view God's grace as something that simply comes to me and it stops with me and I accept it? Or do I understand that once God's grace comes to me, then it's supposed to flow through me to other people? That's how Paul understood it. Paul understood that once he had, once he had encountered the risen Lord, and he understood that God forgave him from all the things that he had done, that that grace was not something that he just took for himself, but it was something that flowed through him. That's why he says that God's grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Have you received God's grace and is God's grace flowing through you to those that you encounter? Do people see the resurrected Lord? Isn't it a shame if we just gather once a year and say, oh, he's risen. Uh, hallelujah, Christ arose and then just go about our business. Hopefully, when we've really encountered the Jesus who hung on the cross for us, the Jesus who walked out of that tomb for us, then people see that Jesus in us. They see that we've been transformed by the grace of God that came to us, and then they see that grace flowing through us as people interact with us, and they see something of who Jesus is. You know, that tradition that Paul talks about, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. There will be opportunities for us to literally sit down and talk through that with people. But more often than that, there will be opportunities for us to show people what that looks like. People that we might not ever have an opportunity to sit down and talk to or to read a Bible with. But people who see in us a change. A change that's only possible because the cross of Christ was God's plan. And that plan makes use of people like us because God's grace through the cross, through the empty tomb, comes to us and flows through us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this day, especially for the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, for his victory over death. Father, we fail you. We fall short. We've sinned in, in so many ways. And yet we're grateful that because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, because of his victory over death, your plan can incorporate even us. That your grace flows to us and through us, Father. Help us to make ourselves conduits of that grace that people might <coughs> interact with Jesus through us in the words that we say, the things that we do. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We can help you this morning. We're going to sing a song. Uh, that kind of speaks to the, the, the theme of resurrection. But here's the thing. I think the end of this song, um, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Let's make that a reality uh, this week.
If there's any way we can help, we would invite you to come now as we stand, as we sing. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. At just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to him You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to him for. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. You may be seated. I'm going to ask uh, the guys that helped me before uh, to come up here. We're about to take up the, the water challenge offering. Um, and of course, if you have been participating in this, or even if you haven't and want to give, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, on the screen is a picture of one of the women, I believe from Ethiopia, uh, that's accessing one of the wells at Healing Hands International. Again, a Christian group uh, has drilled. And uh, you can read the testimonies on that website I gave you about how these wells have changed the lives of families and of people. Um, but I want to read to you from Matthew 25 uh, before we take up this offering. Beginning in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And so in many ways, what we're taking is an offering, not for other people, but we're taking an offering for Jesus. We talked about before, we can't outgive what Christ has done for us. Christ is living water. And in fact, they inscribe that verse on many, if not all the wells that they drill. Uh, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. And out of his belly, out of his soul will, will flow streams of living water. Uh, I'm going to Say a prayer as we prepare uh, to collect this offering. Father, we are grateful for your grace and your mercy to us. Most of all, we're grateful for the grace that
that comes to us through the sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross. But Father, we're also mindful of all the material blessings that you have given to us. Father, things that we take for granted each and every day, the homes that we live in, the food that we eat, the water that we drink, the clothes that we wear. Father, we just assume that these are normal things that everyone has, and yet there are so many people around the world who are struggling. Father, as we collect this offering, I pray that it might be a blessing to those who are most in need. Father, I pray that the name of your son, Jesus Christ, might be exalted, might be glorified through this effort. Father, we know that the people who will benefit from these funds will never know who we are. They might not even hear the name of our church, Father, but they will hear the name of Jesus as they receive something that will give them physical life. And I just pray that there will be much fruit for your kingdom that comes forth from this effort. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a few reminders before we're dismissed. Uh, no evening worship tonight, uh, so enjoy the rest of the day with your families. Also, don't forget we have Feasting on the Word coming up uh, this week, and there's a lot of other things. Uh, Wednesday, we're going to be talking about the resurrection of Jesus, uh, looking at Mark chapter 16, and then all the other stuff coming up is in the, the bulletin. Uh, the day when we're going to decorate the stuffed animals for the kids, that's Thursday morning, uh, 9 a.m., some other stuff coming up. Some of the stuff I haven't put in the bulletin yet, but next week's bulletin, pay attention because there's going to be some things coming up in the next few weeks. There'll be a next week's bulletin. So I just consult the bulletin for all of that. Uh, if you got social media, share what we've talked about this morning. Uh, you can read in the bulletin uh, what, what to share. Basically, the cross of Christ is God's plan. And so that concludes, not forever, but our focus, emphasis on the cross and all the aspects of the cross uh, today, Easter Sunday, seeing that the cross and the resurrection do indeed uh, go together. If you will, stand. And I'm going to ask... Robert, if you will, to dismiss us in prayer. Dear Lord, thanks for giving us a gathering here now, Lord, to study your word and worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Please bless us. Go about our day.